We are today in a time of climate disruption wherein it seems that each day brings fresh news of devastation. Today I name the people of Libya who are facing a catastrophic loss of life, land, and livelihood. Our role is primarily here in Salt Lake City, one of witness, but let it be an active witness by refusing to let despair take over in our hearts and instead turning our hands, hearts, and minds to the work that can be accomplished and the problems that can be solved because they are the ones that are given to us. So let us light our chalice, the symbol of our faith and the light of our commitments to love and justice and recite with me the words of invocation in your order of service. We light this chalice for the warmth of love for the light of truth, and for the energy of action. You may be seated. I am the Reverend Laura Young. My pronouns are she, her, and her. And at this time, I would like all of those who are young and young at heart to come up for a children's story. Right. Rob, uh, can you pick a number and keep it in your heart of one to 100? Okay. All right, because at the end of our children's story, one of you will guess the magic number and become the owner of this new shirt. Okay. What, Isaac? <laughs> no. No, because here's the truth about this story. I bought it at General Assembly this year, and when I got it home, it was too small for me. <laughs> so I figured since you all are still a little smaller than me, you might fit one of you, at least until you wash it the second time. Okay, and on the back, it has some, some words for you. So, okay. All right. I'm going to tell, I'm going to share a story with you today called a creation myth. Who has heard of a myth before? What do you want to tell me about a myth? Yes, a story by people who lived before us who to explain things that they didn't understand. Anyone else have something to say about what a myth is? Yes, Max. Could be something that doesn't exist. Yes, Sydney. Well, 
People like to tell these stories to each other in years to come, right? Okay, last one. Magic and stories about the weather. Okay, so also, those are all really good explanations, but I have a question for you. Do myths have to be false or true? No, right? They can be both true and made up at the same time, right? That's why they're called a myth. Yes. Did you hear that? They're not always true, but sometimes they can be right. I mean, if I hadn't already had Rob pick a number, I would just hand you this t-shirt right now. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so in order to tell you the story, I need someone to tell me their favorite kind of tree. Eat. What kind of tree? Eat. No, no, a tree. A kind of tree, not a kind of candy. A kind of tree. Okay. Gracie, what kind of tree do you like? Okay, macaroni and cheese is not a tree, but I also <laughs> like macaroni and cheese. Okay, let's see. Someone who, Isaac. Um, my favorite kind of um, tree uh, with a double E on the end. Okay. Is um, pretty much any tree that's good to climb. Okay, so who can name a tree for me, Ren? Palm tree. Palm tree. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. All right. And who can tell me the name of their favorite kind of fruit? Etla. Strawberries. strawberries. Okay. So in this story, there is a palm tree that grows strawberries. Okay. It doesn't have to be. It can be true. Or it can be right, or it can be some mix of both, right? Okay, so a creation story. I, we talked about what a myth is, but a creation story is a story about how people came to be. And uh, most cultures and places have these kinds of stories. And the place that I used to live before I came to live in Utah had a creation story from the Chumash people, and that story has a rainbow bridge and dolphins in it. How cool is that, right? But I'm not going to tell you that story today. I'll save that one for another day because we today are going to have a story with our palm tree that grows strawberries. And this palm tree that grows strawberries is in this garden called Eden. And this uh, story, not only with its wondrous tree that grows strawberries, also includes a serpent, which is an old word for snake, two people, and a creator God called Yahweh. And it's a really well-known story. Most of the adults in this room kind of know it because um, they've been exposed to it by living in North America. Um, but this one's a little different. So I encourage you to listen a little differently today. Um, just like, you know, how many of you have seen Cinderella? Yeah. Um, and Disney made that movie, right? Right. Are there other Cinderella stories that you can read? Yes. Yeah, and so just because Augustine came along and put original sin in the Garden of Eden doesn't mean you have to believe that version, right? So this is my version, and I hope you enjoy it. So, in the beginning of our beginnings, Yahweh created the first people, and he planted the most glorious of gardens, which came to be known as Eden for the home for these two people, and they were happy, these two humans, for all they desired was theirs. The weather was perfect, like Santa Barbara. There was plenty to eat, or Salt Lake City, maybe, like today, um, one day out of the year. There was plenty to eat, and they had each other. And best of all, God visited the garden every afternoon and walked with them. And God told them, the most amazing stories. For Yahweh lives a very full life. He has adventures, stories of battles waged and won, monsters slayed, wondrous creatures brought forth, problems solved, and of course the expansion of the universe and all the organizing that that requires. And just the sheer amount of love and joy 
that God experienced as God went about their business. Everything is so fresh and new in this garden. And the baby goats are very cute. Or maybe that's just me. And the woman, the woman in the story, she loves the stories from God the best. And one day she awakens to realize that she wants more than just to listen to stories from God. She realized that she would like to participate in them, maybe even have an adventure or two of her own. Plus, if she has one of those adventures, she would be able to be the storyteller. And that would be great fun to share that with God. Because it's a little one-sided right now. And she wants to give back. She wants to be in a more full relationship. So she resolves that she's going to ask God about that during their afternoon walk. Now the serpent, a crafty creature, immortal, wise, and very capable, overhears the woman as she's musing about her plan and asks her, wait a second, didn't God say, don't eat any of the fruit in the garden? No, the woman says, we can eat any fruit we like, except the fruit of the palm tree with strawberries. We aren't even supposed to touch that one, lest we die. Really? You're not going to die from touching a palm tree that grows strawberries. God just said that because God knows that if you eat that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing the difference between good and evil, and you will become wise beyond belief. And here the woman thinks to herself, oh, this is my chance. What a story that would be to tell God. Delicious strawberry palms. She imagines to herself, guess what, God? I talked to the serpent, and it told me that if I ate the fruit, I would not die. And so I ate the fruit, and I didn't even die. And now I'm wise, just like you, God. It's amazing. And thus, the woman sees the fruit, how delicious it will taste, how nourishing for her body it will be, and how wise it will make her and the man. So she and the man eat the fruit, and it is a delicious strawberry, nourishing and full of life. I wonder how big the strawberries should be. Like little strawberries are like, you know, like big like coconut size. I think coconut size. I think coconut size. And guess what? They don't die. Their eyes are opened. And the serpent told the truth. And they become what's called conscious. No longer only a created one-dimensional being, they have gained the ability to create, to become a bit more like God. It's also clear. It's such an adventure. And they gaze at one another in this moment, and they realize, oh, man, we're not wearing any clothes. We should get dressed. That's the birth of self-consciousness, later known as insecurity from watching fashion magazines. So they make some clothes quickly out of fig leaves, and they look around for that serpent. But of course, the serpent's nowhere to be found. And, and then they hear God coming into the garden OMG, it's God, the man says. Quick, we gotta hide. God is gonna be so mad. Oh man, you're right, breathes the woman. What are we gonna say? God, of course, knows immediately that something is up. What have you done, he says. The man and the woman, they try to explain. Well, first Adam, or man, tries to blame the woman for starting it. It was her idea at all. And the woman says, hey, knock it off. I don't understand. I didn't understand, protests the woman. The serpent tricked me. He told me it would make me wise. And I thought it would bring me closer to you. That's all I really wanted, to be close to you. God sighs. Can you sigh with me? <sighs> Wisdom, my child, is not something that you gain all at once. You have chosen a new path. You've indeed gained the power of creation. But there is a cost. The serpent only told you half of the truth. Whatever you create is subject to the laws of nature, which means decay, loss, and separation from your creations. 
This means that you're going to have to leave the garden and make your own garden and your own way in the world. Man, you will now need to cultivate and grow crops to feed your family. And woman, you have gained the new power to create life within you. And you will bring forth children. Raising them will be hard work, risky, and sometimes painful. But it is also your chance to experience the depth of love that I have for you. For as I have loved you, you will love your children. Life will not be easy, but it will, if you stay awake, make you wise. Leave the garden, the woman says. Give up our walks, but I feel like I want to die right now. Ah, child, I will always be with you. One day, a man named Mark Nepo will write, Quote, that God is everywhere, and the extraordinary is waiting quietly beneath the skin of all that is ordinary. That God is under the porch, as well as on top of the mountain, and joy is in both the front row and the bleachers, if we are willing to be present with where we are. As for death, do not be afraid. Without death, there would be no life, and with death, you return to source, to creation. And so live your life, have your adventures, and remember to love one another. And with that, God left the Garden of Eden to go find that pesky serpent. And the man and the woman sat and contemplated for a long time about what had been shared with them. And then the man stood up and helped the woman to her feet. Well, says the man to his wife, babies, I like the sound of that. I think it is time we give ourselves names. I'm thinking that since you are after all the mother of life, we might just call you that, life. I like the sound of that, Adam, life said. You can also call me Eve, for it means the same thing. So Eve, life, took Adam, man's hand together, and they left the garden to begin their life anew, ready to have an adventure make mistakes, learn, grow, write the most amazing stories, and enjoy all of the children yet to come. And so ends our story. Instead of strawberries this morning, I have, with Kate, collected some fruits over there for you. And one of you lucky children will get the pineapple try not to knock each other over if you don't like pineapple you don't there's apples plums banana all of that and so uh who can, can give who wants to give a number everyone gives a number okay what number do you pick between one and 100 go 69 63 50 tiella 52 max 20, Gracie, 31, Isaac, 100, Celia, 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 53, 91, 30, 30, okay, Sydney, okay, that's bigger than 100, you want something smaller, 98, okay, anybody else, Ezra, Five. Okay. Rob, what was the number? It was 50. 50. So who was the closest? Who guessed 50. Who, who guessed 50? Oh. Okay. You did, Isaac? You did? He said 100. Someone did. Who remembers of the. You feel like you did, Ren? Okay, I will believe Ren. Who says they believe Ren? We believe Ren. Here you go. All right, so let's sing our children out. Take an apple or a fruit of your choice as you head on down to the... Again, don't knock each other down when you grab that pineapple. downstairs for Yeah, yeah. And if he's not down in the hallway, they're down in the hallway. Okay.
This community, our church, and its many ministries are only made possible by the gifts you give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. Many of you pledge monthly to support our work, and for this we are grateful. Your gifts help to ensure that we are able to live our values of love and justice in the world outside. Um, this, here's the poem um, for After a Dream. Uh, in a sleep which enchanted your image, I dreamed of happiness, a glowing mirage. Your eyes were softer, your voice pure and resonant. You shone like a sky lit by the dawn. You called me and I left the earth to fly away with you towards the light. The skies parted their clouds for us to glimpse unexplored splendor, divine glimmers. Alas, alas, the sad awakening from dreams. I call upon you, O oh night, give me back your lies. Come back, come back in your radiance, come back, O oh mysterious night. just go home now okay that was just my voice not the voice of God um, for all we have found the courage to give may we be truly grateful may these gifts be a blessing on South Valley and on the Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster University
So creation myths, they exist to orient uh, people to the nature of the world and their role in it. And the story of Adam and Eve is a mythical journey from innocence to maturity. How we came to become fully adult, mortal humans subject to the laws of nature. The original text makes no mention of sin, original sin, shame, or the devil. Those doctrines came much, much later. In fact, the serpent was revered as a symbol of wisdom and fertility and immortality in the ancient Near East. And the original receivers of that story would have known that. And funnily enough, Yahweh never curses the woman in the story. He describes her fate as subject to the toil of endless pregnancies and to being ruled by the man. He describes her fate. So women do not die or suffer in childbirth because God wished to punish women for Eve's eating of the strawberry from the palm tree. Women died because we had not yet developed good sanitation, prenatal care, and effective contraception, technologies that were very much desired in the ancient world, but not yet available. We're indeed still working on that, aren't we? And that ruling of Adam over, over Eve possibly refers to the tragic loss of original connectedness, perhaps also justification for patriarchy. And Adam's toiling on the earth reflects a pre-modern understanding of the weather and the early stages of agricultural technology. Our crops do not fail because God is angry with us and sends a hailstorm to punish us. Farming requires dedication and hard work, and we are also still learning how to properly irrigate, rotate our crops, and sustain the health of the earth, right? But as Ren said, stories do not need to be true in order to be right. This original story is not also about us. It's not about us. It is a story for the people of Israel and how they might consider their situation and work to change their circumstances during their exile in Babylon or possibly during the Hellenistic Empire, Hellenistic period during Roman oppression. It is not about us. So to put ourselves at the center of it and demand that it speak to us about us is disrespectful to that text and to the culture that produced it. So in rewriting the story, I am seeking to liberate both the text itself and us here in 2023 from the former oppressive interpretations that have been layered upon it time and time again. I seek to engage our imagination so that we may yet become free. My midrash, the Jewish term for finding new meanings in between, behind, and beside the existing text in order to illuminate new opportunities for dialogue and engagement, would have you imagine this. Your humanity is not an obstacle, but rather a threshold. Your humanity is not an obstacle. It is a threshold to remind you that in fact partaking in life is required in order to grow wise. And that while we make mistakes, there's always a path back to right relationship. The goal of that original text and mine, is not to have you return to the Garden of Eden. That's a static model of innocence 
or perfection that mature adults cannot return to. And frankly, why would we want to give up our ability to explore our humanity? In full, not even children want that. Their curiosity for the world become the seeds of later wisdom. The goal, in fact, is our living, breathing, richly relational humanity that is capable of holding all of the complexity without collapsing into binaries of tribalism and the false idea that anyone's gender identity is fully known or understood. The God Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible is a reflection of who those people were that were writing and worshiping and living and dying in that time and who they needed their God to be. Their solutions cannot be our solutions. By the function of our living here in 2023, we mostly do not know the toil of endless pregnancies as female people. We do not know widespread famine, and we do not know what it is like to be subject to death by a cruel and capricious regime. Not here in Salt Lake City. So their answers cannot be cut and copied from the text onto our text. However, asking who God needs to be right now can still be a useful question because we are still seeking to understand who we are and who we might yet become. And those ancient people can also teach us a little bit about resilience, determination, loving each other as best we can, and seeking an ever more inclusive justice. One of our unique challenges here in North America in 2023 is that we seem to have forgotten how to use this word called God. In our rush to shed the hypocrisy of organized religion and our adoption of the scientific model to establish a shared understanding, we also somehow lost the language of God. Instead of communicating with curiosity, we post angry memes in quotes to our social platforms in response to those we heartily disagree with. And our elected officials often to often rely on simple narratives to win votes rather than invite creative and productive responses to complex challenges. International trade agreements, the farm bill, healthcare policy, all of these challenges are incredibly complex. But working in sound bites prevents us from engaging in the necessary nuanced and thoughtful reflection required to find real solutions that reduce suffering and encourage thriving. We have become separated from one another, but our desire to remain connected remains the same. We desire connectedness. But many of us are rightly dismayed at the hardline stances of too many religious institutions and public projects that have let us down. The pathways of connectedness, such as religious institutions or unions, trade associations, and neighborhood co-ops have been undermined by our consumerist culture that prizes financial achievement over everything else. We hardly have time for church on Sundays because the rest of our week is packed so tightly, squeezing out the gaps in our schedule so we might only occasionally hear a whisper in our mind that there might actually be another way to live. Does it ever occur to us that there might be another way to live? that we don't actually have to pack our lives in order to be worthy or good. And yet we live in this gap, right? Where the world demands and expects achievement and accomplishment, 
but we are tired and longing for refuge and renewal, and we don't quite yet know how to get there. Feelings of isolation and loneliness, which are so prominent in our culture right now, are an indicator of our being in that gap. Our desire for connectedness is as strong as the day we left the garden. Writer and speaker, former Episcopalian priest, Barbara Brown, Barbara Brown Taylor agrees with this. Barbara Brown Taylor has a way of talking about that word God and our need for connectedness that is inviting and comforting for those of us who exist outside of the lines of mainstream religion. She recently spoke with Krista Tippett, who you may know is the host of the podcast On Being. And during their conversation, Barbara Brown Taylor noted that there is a huge hunger for holiness in the world, a desire to rewild the soul. Reminds me of Eve a bit, right? Desire for a wildness something more than just a static perfection and a packed Google Calendar with reminders every 10 minutes. A rewilding is desire for connectedness and a hunger for holiness. And Barbara Bowne Taylor notes that this is happening at the same time that many mainline churches are emptying out. And how many churches have hired consultants who try to suggest that solving this is that we should adopt a modern rock concert style form of worship, write blogs and build our social media presence with cute pictures of I don't know what on X and Instagram. But Barbara Brown Taylor said what is needed is the exact opposite. We do not need a better performance of God. We do not need a better performance of God because God is not entertainment and God is not to be consumed. God is not a consumer product that we take off the shelf, use on occasion and discard when it feels no longer relevant. God is a way of being in the world. A way of being in the world that disrupts the status quo that we demand that by demanding that we show up for ourselves in one another in ways that push back on that status quo of packing. And I want to state clearly for here, for everyone here, that this word God that I am using is a signifier. It's a symbol, it's a shortcut phrase that I am using. But what I mean by it is the underneath mystery that calls us to a full and beautiful humanity. We need that thing, that mystery, that sense of connection to ourselves and one another and the wider world that such that we can see and hear and know and walk with one another in the garden that is now. We need pathways that can take us into a deeper and more nuanced, thoughtful and effective communication and connectedness. We need to keep writing our stories and rejecting the ones that no longer serve us, especially the ones that prize that lone hero saving the world through their superpowers, their sacrifices, and their general badassery of fighting skills, and instead reminds us that we are stronger together than we are apart. What Barbara Brown Taylor wanted her listeners to understand is that the language of God is always being reimagined and rewritten in every generation, and over each person's lifetime. And that is the actual point, so to speak. The invitation to imagine the world and ourselves again and again and again. The hunger for connectedness never 
wanes. In that same episode of On Being, Krista Tippett wonders about our modern predicament in which we now know so much of what is happening in the world every single day. Our phones can deliver to us news of disaster and turmoil and strife and hunger and pain all day, every day, and how stressful this can become because we are mostly powerless to affect any change in response to that. We can do some things locally, but our ability to really impact events that happen far, far away from us is fairly minimal. But the onslaught of that information often overwhelms our systems. Krista Tippett wondered if somehow this is like becoming like God, omniscient or all-knowing, but without omnipotence or power. It's a reference to that classic theological puzzle of the three-legged stool, the idea that God cannot be all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good if there is so much suffering and evil in the world. And the puzzle challenges the students to decide which of the three of those legs they can do without, knowing that, of course, no stool balances on two legs alone. So like all good and great puzzles, there is no one right answer. Instead, it is a call to engage, to pay attention, to stay awake, and in time, hopefully, become a little bit wiser. I also wonder if perhaps there's a way to add a fourth leg. I encourage you today to take your hunger seriously. Let it guide you to the places and relationships that can nourish, sustain, enliven, and unleash your wild and precious soul. Amen. Stand if you like. because I realized that we forgot to do like, the whole middle of the service. So sit down. We're just going to go back and let Kate do her reading. <laughs> this apple is tempting. So I was <laughs> In a way that a strawberry isn't. Oh. Okay, how's that? You want to be right on? No. Okay, so today's reading is by Julia Fehrenbacher. The most important thing. I am making a home inside myself, a shelter of kindness where everything is forgiven 
everything allowed, a quiet patch of sunlight to stretch out without hurry, where all that has been banished and buried is welcomed, spoken, listened to, released. A fiercely friendly place I can claim as my very own. I am throwing arms open to the whole of myself, especially the fearful, fault-finding, falling apart, unfinished parts, knowing every seed and weed, every drop of rain has made the soil richer. I will light a candle, pour a hot cup of tea, gather around the warmth of my own blazing fire. I will howl if I want to, knowing this flame can burn through any perceived problem, any prescribed perfectionism, any lying limitation, every heavy thing. I am making a home inside myself where grace blooms in grand and glorious abundance, a shelter of kindness that grows all the truest things. I whisper hallelujah to the friendly sky. Watch now as I burst into blossom. As we extinguish our chalice, We extinguish our chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. And we hold each other in our hearts until we meet again. You may be seated for the postlude. Thank you. 